Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, even your relatives. It's all out there. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's podcast. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, my bank accounts, or other sensitive information. Aura also does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats I can't see. It's really easy to set up, so I don't have to download several different apps to get things like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more. I get everything at one affordable price. You may already have one or two of these tools already, but not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Aura is always on, doing the hard work of keeping me safe so I can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. I value my privacy, and I value yours, my valued listener. You can go to Aura.com slash new to start your two-week free trial, also linked below in the description. Remember, guys, it's a two-week free trial, so allow Aura to be the security that gives you the peace of mind and the comfort that someone out there is looking out for you. Aura.com slash new. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for another episode of the New Nation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike. It is lovely to have you all back with me. I have a very special guest today. Uh, this is my priest, uh, I started coming to St. Mary's of the Seven Sorrows here in Nashville about three to four months ago, and I've totally fallen in love with the Mass, and I'm sitting here now with Father Jade Neely. Hello, Father. Hello. Glad to be here. This is, we, we have one mic working, so you know what? I'll, I'll probably just lean in and put the mic just so that you don't have to grab it. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and how you found yourself in Nashville. So I... Uh, was uh, born in Iowa and moved to Oklahoma as a kid and grew up in Oklahoma City. And I was raised uh, Methodist and um, uh, w- without going into all the details, uh, basically um, uh, I became uh, Catholic really uh, my senior year of high school and uh, then through college went through uh, RCIA, which is a um, rite of Christian initiation of adults, which is a basically classes and stuff that adults would take if they were interested in becoming Catholic or even just finding more about it, the Catholic faith. And then, um, yeah, became Catholic in 1995, my freshman year of college. And then uh, after college, I, I went to seminary uh, for the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City for a year, and I uh, wasn't really ready to be there, and it that didn't work out. So I went and worked some uh, different jobs for about five years, and um, then I entered the Carmelites, the uh, Discalced Carmelites in the southern province. So that's the order that, um, I mean, it goes back to the Holy Land in Mount Carmel and um, uh, to the to the early, um, well, there's a rule of, of St. Albert they follow, which is probably written about 1205 A.D., and I could go into the story of that. And then fast forward into Spain in the 16th century, and there's a reform movement in the Carmelites led by St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross that became eventually split off and became a separate order and became known as the Discalced Carmelites. And also St. Therese of Lisieux in uh, 19th century France, she was also a Discalced Carmelite. So I did part of my most of my seminary with them, and I was with them about four and a half years and I was in temporary vows, and uh, when that situation didn't work out, uh, the bishop of Nashville at the time was Bishop Choby, and he sent guys, his seminarians, down to the Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans. This is not Notre Dame University. This is a this is a local a regional seminary uh, run by the Archdiocese of New Orleans. And um, anyway, he was willing to take me on as a seminarian, and um, my temporary vows just expired, so I didn't have any more obligations with the Carmelites. And uh, I was ordained a priest here for the Diocese of Nashville in 2012, so I'm a diocesan priest. And I was uh, at the cathedral my first four years, and then I became a pastor for the first time here at St. Mary's in 2016. And we have six-year terms in our diocese, and, and I was just re-upped for another six years. So uh, that would expire in 2028, but, you know, it's it's not like a guaranteed thing. I mean, they might ask you to move somewhere if somebody gets sick or drops dead or whatever. Anyway, so that's where I've, I've been here as a pastor just over 
Oh, seven years, I guess, something like that. Almost. And years. and you're the only guy here, right? You're the only priest here because I I see you every Sunday, and you do both masses, right? Yeah, that's correct. This, even though it's in Nashville, this is a rather small parish, and and I'm just the only yeah clergy here. So. Okay. Let's talk about the Latin Novus Ordo because this is something that I've been talking about for a while now, and my listeners want to hear more about it. So. Can you tell us a little bit of the history of the Latin Novus Ordo and how you came to, um, what's the what's the right word? I don't want to say perform the the, the mass or celebrate the mass. Yeah, t- tell us a little bit about uh, both of those. Okay, boy. Uh, well, okay, so the w- the mass we have here at St. Mary's is the current mass. It's called the Novus Ordo because... Uh, the first version, uh, which was the version of the Mass after the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, came out in 1969 in Latin, and then the English version is 1970. And what we have now is basically the third English version of that, which I think St. John Paul II issued in the third revision in early 2000s. Anyway, so, and you could celebrate the entire Mass in Latin if you wanted, wanted to. In fact, Latin as with church documents, so with the sacraments, Latin is the typical edition. What you need permission for is to have vernacular translations of it and stuff. And so uh, now, if you wanted to do the whole thing in Latin, it might be right, kind of jarring for a lot of people. So uh, now at our sister parish over to Sumption, which I think you've been to a few times, they they do have permission to celebrate what we would call the 1962 Order of Mass, which was the last version of what you might call the the Trinitine Mass, the Mass as it was reformed by the Council of Trent in the 16th century. And, and you know, in every century or two, or sometimes more than that, that, you know, they would maybe change the calendar or update the number of saints or take some saints off and put new ones on there. And But there wouldn't be any major, you know, substantive changes. But there were really some major changes that came after the Second Vatican Council. and And that's kind of where... A lot of the, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. A lot of the uh, controversy and stuff is so. But I don't have permission to celebrate the old mass. I, I never have. And and actually, since our parish just a mile or so away from here celebrates the old mass, and and they are doing so with the, you know, the bishop's permission and so forth, after the recent documents from the Vatican kind of cracking down on the Latin mass. Um, that's a whole whole other tangent we could go down. Um, but so what I'm trying to basically I do I celebrate the current mass. I just try to use the most traditional options because what I'm trying to do is, well, have a very beautiful reverent liturgy is the most important thing. And so um, but also try to emphasize what Pope Benedict called the, the hermeneutic of continuity, uh, you know, as opposed to a hermeneutic of. Uh, of rupture or, her- or hermeneutic, well, he used the term hermeneutic of reform. In other words, seeing the current mass as a continuation of the way the mass has always been celebrated in the Roman Church, uh, as opposed to a hermeneutic of rupture that the new mass is this brand new thing. And and um, anyway, I'm trying to show the people the beauty of the tradition because that's part of what attracted me to uh, Catholicism. So, for example, now. Actually, most of the last is, mass is, is still in English. I did try to do uh, – well, my original goal was to do – there's different ways to divide the mass, one of which would be the parts that are we call the ordinary of the mass, the parts that don't change from week to week, and then the propers of the mass. So the propers would be like the readings, the opening prayers. There's a prayer over the, over the gifts. There's a closing prayer. Uh, the prefaces, which uh, are going to pick up the theme of the different feast or season that's uh, right before the, the Sanctus. Those are the parts that change. And then you have the ordinary parts like, you know, the penitential rite, uh, of which there's lots of options, or the canon of the mass and stuff like that. Um, so my original goal was to do the proper parts in English in the vernacular and the ordinary parts, the parts that don't change in the English, sorry, in, in Latin. But that was kind of a bridge too far for this parish because um, I kind of I, I talk about turning up the Latin volume a little too much. I had to back off a little bit. So I do the consecration in Latin, right. but I don't do the whole Eucharistic prayer in Latin. And actually, in the old Mass, that was done silently anyway, which I think I think lends itself more to to the Latin. So what I do is 
uh, we have a lot of the Gregorian chant, which is again this rich patrimony of the of the Roman Church. When I when I talk about the Roman Church, the Church that grew out of the city of Rome and the way Mass was done in Rome, and is what spread through most of Western Europe, and because of Western history, spread through. Uh, most of the world. It's called the Roman Rite or the Latin Rite of the Catholic Church. And anyway, one of which is um, uh, Gregorian chant, which uh, takes its name from Pope St. Gregory the Great, who was Pope around the year 600. Uh, he did not invent Gregorian chant, but he was a great reformer of it, organizer of it, promoter of it, and that's why it takes his name. They, they actually think that Gregorian chant is related to the way the Jews chanted in the temple that there's a a a, 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 a correlate or a, a, a relation there. I don't know, I don't know a lot about that, but as you can see, if you I'm showing him our worship aid, that if you're familiar with modern music, you know you have the treble clef and bass clef, right? Well, this is an earlier form of uh, this is medieval music, and it has four these four lines, and instead of modern notes, you know, like quarter notes and half notes, it has. Um, the square notes they're called, and, and there's different ways of um, emphasizing whether you hold a note or stuff like that. And um, the, the one square above the square means that you move up. Right. Yeah. And then there's different lines and things. And, and I'm not an expert in all this, but right. um, but basically, and so some of these things come from, um, and, and I put the dates in here deliberately. See, see this is an, there's an Agnus stay here. Yeah. Which is uh, this? What that means for Sundays in Advent and Lent. So we're using it during Lent. This is from the 13th century. So it would have been chanted, especially in monasteries and stuff. This is another version of the Agnus Dei from the 12th century. And um, so I'll do things. Well, like, well, I have a sort of a tiered system at the different masses. I have an English mass, a vigil mass, which is mostly English with just some very basic chant, and a lot of that is is tourists and visitors. And then the nine o'clock is our sort of main parish mass where we do where we have a choir or you might call it a scola when they do the traditional stuff but they all, we also have hymns in english and stuff yeah that's kind of our main parish mass where the most regular families come and so that's the heaviest latin and i realize not that's not everybody's cup of tea and so then at the noon mass which again it fluctuates a lot we have we're downtown so there's a lot of um if there's a Titans game going on or if there's something that TPAC, which is the Tennessee Performing Arts Center, where they have, you know, Broadway shows and stuff. And there could be a lot of tourists and stuff and there's hotels. So I try to have sort of three levels of um, accessibility. Oh, so one of the things I would say is it, if we were having an academic discussion here, part of it is now a lot of things were changed. And I think a lot of things were changed that went beyond the mandate of the document from Vatican II is called Sacrosanctum Concilium. And then uh, there was a, a, a concilium, a committee that came up with the changes made. And, um, well, I don't want to get too far afield here, but let me focus. Um, oh, so what I was going to say is um, we've now had, uh, since 1970, we've now had over 50 years of the vernacular. So if you were to ask me, uh, is is the is the Latin Mass the 1962 Missal? Is it superior in many ways to the current Missal? I would argue that it is. And in fact, Pope Benedict called the current one a a manufactured liturgy, a liturgy by committee. It 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 violated the well, maybe that's a strong word. It did not follow the principle of organic development laid out, which was a liturgical principle for a long time. It means to to develop organically like a plant would grow, right? So you, a tree, you know, or, uh, you know, it's going to sprout new new blooms and you discern which ones are going to produce fruits and you leave those and the ones that are dead branches or aren't producing good fruit, you trim those off so that the remaining branches are healthier and flourish. But what you don't do is cut the tree down to a trunk and try to impose a new uh, tree on it or something. So that's, that's not organic development. So what Vatican II called for was the changes to the liturgy should only be minor and necessary changes, kind of simplifying some things, and um, uh, but not kind of the wholesale renovation that they did of the current liturgy. But I don't. All that is kind of above my pay grade. I'm just a parish priest. I don't have the option 
even in a practical manner of just doing all the old sacraments and the old mass and stuff. But the other thing is, I would say, after 50 years of people being used to the vernacular, it's hard to get your average Catholic to go all the way back to, to all in Latin and stuff like that. I think we wouldn't have had all these liturgy wars if we had just, um, if they had just maybe taken the old mass and just, you know, allowed a little more for the use of some of the vernacular, which, you know, I like having the readings of, in the vernacular. I like some of the things. I, I brought out from our vault here um, a missal. This is this is dated 1962. Okay. So the, is this a 62 missal? No, I'm sorry. This is dated 1964. I meant okay. to, I meant to say. So there was the 1962, and that's the that's the one before the reforms of Vatican II were implemented. Then there was a transitional missal in like 1965, which I think is what this is, although it's dated a little before that, and th which only made some modest changes, which is what I want to talk about. And then the current missal, which came out in Latin in 69, English in 70, is the one we have now. But if you look at this one, this transitional one, you'll see that, well, let me back up. A lot of the readings and things are already in English, yeah. right? And the the introit, the that's like the psalm at yeah. the beginning, that's in English. The opening prayer is in Latin. But the canon, first of all, it's only the Roman canon, right. which is called the Roman canon because it was like the it was the heart of the mass. It's the only one I use here at St. Mary's. That's the one with all the saints. If you're familiar with it, mm -hmm. it's the it was sort of the identifying canon of, of the Roman church, uh, the Eastern rites had different canons that they would rotate through. But, and so, you know, you meant, it mentions the apostles and, and, and Mary and Joseph and so forth. Uh, Joseph was added, um, to, uh, I think by John the 23rd, uh, but it also lists all these saints that are Roman saints. So we have Lin Linus, Cletus, Clement. These are the first successors of St. Peter. That's during the Eucharistic prayers. Yeah. Th yeah. There's, there's one set of saints before the consecration, another set after. And the saints mentioned after are, a lot of them are saints. Yeah. There's also female saints that were Roman martyrs, some of them in Rome. It's Agatha. Like Agatha, Agnes, or, or in the vicinity of Rome, like St. Cecilia, mm -hmm. St. Lucy. So they were saints who grew, were present in sort of the Roman milieu that, that, a group is the, why they're incorporated into the Roman Mass. Anyway, so you'll see the canon and the, the words of consecration are all still in Latin. Oh, that's what that's what you read. You yeah, read this out loud. Right. It's part of it, and it's something that I think. Sorry, if if you're if you guys are wondering about the audio, we're switching back and forth between one mic because obviously, like the show has always had since the beginning, uh, sound issues. But uh, I digress. So there's if you go to a Latin Mass, a low Mass, you you hear very little. Of it, uh, I think you you really only hear the priest's homily, which is done in the vernacular, and you hear you know the aremos and uh, the uh, dominus obiscum and stuff like that when the priest addresses the uh, congregation. But with this Latin novus ordo, which I found something that was very interesting the first time we came here, that you started the Eucharistic prayers in English, and then during the would this be the consecration yeah, or the yeah. transubstantiation? Yeah, yeah that you said that aloud in Latin. You didn't really say it loud. No, actually, you brought it, it okay, down. so you brought it down. Because it used to be silent. Right. You're not allowed to do it silently. Right, okay. So, so I appreciated that when I heard it. I said, oh, he's, he's doing that in Latin, which I, I liked because I do have, uh, during the Mass, I have my 62 Missal with me. So I'm able to follow that along. Um, and so it, it's, it's just really, if you guys, especially people who are newer to Catholicism or people who are interested, I think this Latin Novus Ordo Mass is very interesting because it, it, it has, I don't want to say modernity to it, but it has the function in it that you're, yeah, accessibility. You're able to understand it, but it also has that reverence from the Roman Mass, which I think is really, really cool. And it has the incense. So if you love incense, it has the incense. It has the altar servers who are in number. The one thing that it doesn't have is, I guess, the altar servers will, what do they do with the, with the, with the, uh, with the, a Tridentine Mass where the servers will like hold up the uh, priest's, um, yeah. what are they called? The, not cloak, but uh, the, the, the chat. The cha right, right, right. So, although I have had seminarians that I have had seminarians that like to do that, oh, okay. it just but it's not technically in the current rubrics. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Uh, so it's very, it's very interesting what he's showing me right now. So, yeah, you'll notice, um, you know, you'll notice that the, the canon, uh, the Roman canon is all still in Latin and stuff, but they also still have some more English stuff. And then, uh, they still had the last gospel at the, at the end, mm -hmm. uh, which is, um, uh, in Latin. So anyway, so one, one could make an argument and one of my brother 
priest made the argument that that this is the missile kind of that was envisioned by Sacrosanctum Concilium. Uh, the the readings are pretty much like they are in the Latin Mass. There's just a little bit more allowance for English, but um, it, it it isn't the radical change. So this is basically what Vatican II envisioned the Mass to be. It, it, if you read the document, I mean, it says things like Gregorian chant should have pride of place. It says um, there should be wider allowance for the vernacular. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anywhere the entire mass should be in the vernacular with no Latin whatsoever, right. which is what you get in, in most places, and which is what I uh, grew up. It says um, things like, you know, the, the pipe organ should be held. And I put these quotes in our yeah, worship aid. To, to emphasize this this continuity with the tradition, uh, that the pipe of uh, of pipe organ it says in the Latin Church should be held in high esteem. Mm -hmm. uh, it says uh, the Church acknowledges Gregorian chant. This is from the Vatican II document. The Church acknowledges Gregorian chant as specially suited to the Roman liturgy. Therefore, other things being equal, it should be given pride of place in liturgical services. Now we do still have there are some beautiful English hymns, especially like 19th century stuff. So, so what we would we would we have the propers, which at nine o'clock these are like the intro to the communion antiphon and stuff. They can be entirely replaced with hymns, which is usually what you get and what I was used to in, in most Catholic churches I went to. But you can do the and they're actually the Psalms. They're from the book of right. Psalms, which is like the original hymnal of the church. And which we get that from Judaism because the songs, the Psalms, if you look at the book of Psalms, you'll actually see musical notations in the actual text. Like, really? you know, this is played, you know, with, with the harp or different musical instruments. And so uh, we get that from Judaism. So these propers like the communion antiphon, the, the entrance antiphon or the intro, the offertory antiphon, these can be done. They can be sung according to Gregorian chant, and there's all these English resources now, where you can sing them. And if you have choirs that don't have the the technical ability to do Gregorian chant, because it is it is difficult to yeah. learn. A lot of people, even musicians, are not familiar with this medieval type of musical notation, and so there's a learning curve. But they have simplified English ones, kind of as a, you know different levels of difficulty uh, where you can actually sing these in English. And actually some people are developing in Spanish where okay. instead of this communion antiphon here in Latin, you could sing the, this, and it's just a quote from the Psalms. Yeah. You could sing it in English or, you know, in Spanish, if you had a Spanish mass. I like it so much more in Latin anyway. And then we, and then we do have these beautiful English hymns. So we have a communion antiphon, and then we have a communion hymn. And sometimes we might have another communion song because communion takes a while. Uh, Oh, I, I guess I should say, well, let me, since I got this in my head, this is um, a book called The Parish Ritual. So this is before Vatican II. Okay. This is the rite of baptism. But it, you'll notice they've already started allowing greater use of English, yeah. right? Um, and so, and it's to make it more accessible to people, like some of the opening prayers for baptism, so that people can understand you. But certain parts you have to do in Latin. Right. So like when you do the prayer of exorcism over the salt, you have to do in Latin. When you cast out the demon, the, these, these minor exorcism prayers, exorcizo te immunde spiritus, um, I exorcise you, unclean spirit. Right. That has to be done in Latin because it, you're like talking to the devil and he doesn't like Latin. And so these minor exorcisms, but a lot of the other prayers and stuff are in English. The actual baptism itself has to be done in Latin. Um, Ego te baptizo in nomine patris et filii spiritus sancti. You say the name of the person, then I baptize you. Um, Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Because you said something very interesting, and it may lend to your Protestant past. You just said in doing this uh, uh, exor this prayer of exorcism, uh -huh. you said you talk to the devil because the devil doesn't like Latin. I've <laughs> asked I've asked Protestants this so many times. Yeah. It has to do with our Mother Mary. Yeah. They said Mary can't hear you. She's not. She, 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 you know, she can't be an intercessor. Yeah. Uh, whatever. So then I'll say, can the devil influence you? Can the devil speak to you? And they'll say yes. And I say okay. Well, I <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So that's something that I always found interesting. And I have heard that the devil and demons do not like Latin. Yeah, I've heard that too. And and from like exorcists of, uh, of which I'm not, but right. exorcists. So we're talking. These are. Let me just back up. These are what are called minor exorcisms, mm -hmm. which are part of the rite of baptism. And right. you're not necessarily right. here for a Hollywood right. exorcism trying to exorcise yeah. a demon. So these are minor exorcisms, mm -hmm. which any priest can do, and even deacons if they follow the the stuff in the the, the liturgical books. Now, what, what you're talking about is a major exorcism, right. which is where a person is full on possessed. Uh, you have to have a, a priest who's specially deputed or appointed by his bishop, who has special training. Right. 
right? Yeah. So, um, so there, pre- there, we have uh, two priests in our diocese who are especially appointed, and you have to rule out other things. Act- actual full blown possession is rather rare, right. but it, there are other lesser forms of like the devil sort of bothering you or annoying you or right. things like you know. Uh, I just wanted to say that. So, like the anointing with chrism here mm-hmm. with the oil of catechumens, it's done in Latin. Yeah. Um, so the uh, anointing with the baptism, chrism is done in Latin. Will a baptism here, like let's suppose I want to baptize my son, will will a baptism here have special prayers done in Latin only? Okay, well, see, that's what I've d- see. This is my uh, my personal thing. Like, how to be a traditional Vatican II priest? Some people would say that's an oxymoron that you can't. Right. Yes, but I but I. I am a I am a Vatican II priest in that I am a priest who lives in the post Vatican II church in the mainstream church, you know. But I want to try to do things with an eye to that continuity with tradition, which is part of why I became Catholic because um, I, I, as a Protestant, I had lost that connection with the historical church, right? So for me, um, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, oh. Uh, or baptisms in Latin would be oh yeah yeah so so what I can do is uh, there are certain parts which I've based on the, this pre-Vatican II book where I can do the actual a- baptism itself in Latin but the you know the readings from Scripture and other prayers I'll do in English right, right, right. so like the core things having to do with the core of the sacrament if you will just like at the Mass I do the words of consecration in Latin but right. the other parts not right. so, so and and it seems to be that's what the the in these. These, this book came out of the 1950s. They were already experimenting with greater use of the, of the vernacular, but they still had a principle of the core of the sacrament is still in Latin. Uh, and so, and I think if, if they had stuck with that, we, you know, as far as the, the old mass, if they just said, we're going to keep things pretty much like they are structurally, we're just going to allow a little more use of the vernacular. I think because the purpose of that was to help people understand what's going on and stuff, right? So I think I think we wouldn't have had all these sort of liturgy wars and things like that. Uh, one thing is, um, I love the old Latin Mass. I think it's very beautiful. I, I kind of a- equate it to like opera, like it's kind of a- an acquired taste, right, I agree, like yeah. Italian opera. You got to study. You need like a book or something to right. go along with it and stuff like that. Yep. But for your average Catholic, it's not terribly accessible um there's a big learning curve and 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 again having had the vernacular now sometimes 100 percent vernacular masses for 50 or more years it's going to be hard to go that far back i mean these are all kind of discussions above my pay level and stuff but but oh the other thing i should mention is yeah we we, yeah the other big thing which uh we do here at st mary's and uh which our bishop is, is fully, you know, on board of, uh, is uh, we, we have we do mass ad orientum, which means towards the east. Which we use the the old altar. Basically, this church uh, this church was built in uh, 1847. Uh, there was a renovation of the sanctuary in the early 20th century, but basically, it hasn't been changed. So it's set up to do the old mass. Basically, where there's a chair with um, it's called a sedalia. It has three positions: one for in the high mass, you had the priest, the deacon, and the subdeacon. It still has the altar rail, um, which I which I love, by the way. Yeah. And um, and it has the old altar with the steps going up to it. And um, we even had an, have an old school confessional, kind of like in the movies, which I like. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, so in other words, the adorantum it means towards the east because this church was built facing the east, and the, there's all this symbolism of. Christ as the rising sun and the rising sun representing the resurrection after, you know, the night of death and, and, and all this sort of symbolism. And some people, you know, think, well, why does the priest have his back to me? But it's really more about all of us on a journey together. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the priest is up there interceding for you. And we have this, there's this symbolism of going up the steps into the sanctuary as like going up a mountain. So like Moses went up the mountain to encounter God and brought the commandments back down to the people. So the priest is like up there in the mountain uh, interceding for the people with God. And then he brings the Eucharist down to the people, like at the altar rail. Oh, I like that. Yeah, which is, and the altar rail is like an extension of the altar. And um, so, uh, you know, I can't forbid people from receiving in the hand. It's it's not my preference, and that's a whole other issue. But most people here receive kneeling uh, on the tongue, 
And if somebody puts their hand out, I mean, I, I will put it in their hand. As well, well, can I speak speak about that for a second? Because when we first came here, I was all about it. I saw, oh, I said they have a communion rail. This is awesome. My wife, on the other hand, I think it was more of a self conscious thing. She has like a, a you know an interesting uh, yeah. thing about that. But she was one of these people that put her hand out to start, and it was also one of these things where she noticed a lot of the women are veiled here, which is you know something for no, nobody really thinks about that for a Novus Ordo mass, but eventually. I kind of like, you know, white pilled her on the receiving it on the tongue and she's starting to do that more. Yeah. And, and I, and I think it's great. I think it's, I, I think it's a really beautiful liturgy and I think it's a really beautiful mass and, you know, not to knock the Novus Ordu there, there, I've had, I had a conversation with you, e. Michael Jones last week about this, where there's a division with Catholics where some of the traditional Catholics will say, oh, well, you're a Novus Ordo Catholic. And that it's yeah. sowing unnecessary division. Now, yeah. there are things, especially within the German church, I think, that, yeah. you know, they're doing like the chicken dance at Mass and something like that, which is obviously not good. But I don't think it's wise to separate Catholics based yeah. on what kind of Mass they go to. Yeah. Um, but, uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Let me just finish a couple thoughts. So, okay. So the, the crazy thing is, uh, you wouldn't know this by the way, you know, most masses and the way I attend masses, attended masses as a, as a lay Catholic and stuff. But the, the missile, the current missile, the current Novus Order missile actually presumes that you're doing ad orientum. Oh, really? And I will give you a perfect example here. Okay. So this is uh, after the consecration, you know. Um, Okay, the the priest genuflects, take, taking the host and holding it slightly raised above the patent or above the child, while facing the people, says aloud, "Behold the Lamb of God! Behold Him who takes away the sins of the world! Uh, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb." Okay, together with the people, he adds, "Lord, I'm not worthy. You should enter into my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed." Then it says right here, the priest facing the altar says quietly, "May the body of Christ keep me safe forever, lasting." for eternal life. So he says that quietly as he's receiving communion. Now, why would it tell him to face the altar if he's already facing the altar and the people, if they're all the same direction? Right, exactly, yeah. So most of the time, if I'm doing versus populum, which I you know, used to do, especially when I was a younger priest and stuff, I'm facing the people. Right. It says, he faces the people and says, and the altar is between me and the people, right. behold the Lamb of God. And then it says, around, and then it says, the priest facing the altar, well, He's already facing the altar. Why? Why is there a rubric? Why is that rubric necessary? Right, right, right. Um, and then, um, anyway, so that's just one example of um, the bottom line is yes, a versus populum has become the norm in the last forty or fifty years, and there are. Uh, I mean, I think you could make an argument that I don't need permission to do autorantum because the missile actually presumes it. However. One of my priest friends says, you have to live indoors. I mean, you have to, in other words, you could have a bishop, and some bishops do forbid uh, ad orantum in the Novus Ordo. That would make your life difficult, and I would just have to, you know, bring in a, a free tanning altar like we used to have here for a while. The disallow, like disallowance of that, they, they're, I assume, and not knowing much about the not not knowing no, much about the politics of, of yeah. the Vatican, I assume it's because the Vatican has outlined the way the mass is done. Yeah. One needs special permission to do the Latin mass, but I don't understand it. It, it, it doesn't seem like a like a slight, or it doesn't seem like that it's wrong to yeah. do the mass yeah. in the traditional way. So it's weird when they say you know a bishop will forbid a mass yeah. to take place a certain way. So. It's, it, it's a very interesting um, thing to consider, but I wanted to talk to you because I know we don't have too much time. I wanted to talk to you about your priestly activities and actually what it is being a priest and what it's like. And a couple of quick questions here before I get into the one question that I wanted to ask, and I do this a lot. Um, can lay people, someone like myself, someone who's a baptized Catholic, can we baptize in cases of urgency? We see a car accident and someone's laying you know, dying on the floor and they express, I want to be baptized. Oh, well, yeah, if they wanted to. Like, I can case. lick my thumb and, you know, really make it genuine and say, you know, I baptize you in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy well, Spirit. Like, thing, is though, that binding? I don't, I'm not, I don't think saliva is counted as water. Okay, so it would have to be water. It would have to be water in some form. That's why you always carry your holy water yeah. in the car. It doesn't have to be holy water, but yeah, holy, having holy water with you would be beneficial to that. Or if, if the person person didn't ask for a baptism you can still just sprinkle the person with holy water a as a way to help ask, ask god to bless them and to chase away the devil and stuff like that well, you I mean, blessed the podcast before we started I yeah think. yeah 
because you were having technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So any sort of water you could do. Um, but yeah, in a case of emergency or if you had a child who, you know, uh, was in serious danger of death or something, there wasn't really time to call a priest. Uh, you could do anybody can do. They don't even have to be a Catholic. They just oh, have really? to. They just have to intend to do what the church does when she baptizes, and they just have to use water and use the Trinitarian formula. Like um, I, bless, I baptize you in the name of Jesus. That doesn't work. Right. That doesn't count. Um, there is a scripture verse that that's from, but it's it's not adequate for the formula. Uh, there, there's also the verse where Christ says, at the end of Matthew's gospel, go forth and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. That's where we get our formula from. So it has to be in that form. It can't be in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. There was a trend to do that sometimes. It, the, the the problem with that is, yeah. um, there the uh, in theology they're they're what we call what's proper to to a person of the Trinity as opposed to what's appropriated to. So, um, the incarnation is proper to the Son. He's the only person of the Trinity, the second person who was incarnate. But Redeemer is not proper to him; it's appropriated to him because really. And, and like the term creator is appropriate to the Father. Because in other words, all three persons of the Trinity created the universe. Right. All three persons are involved in the redemption. Right. Now, Christ has a special role. All three are involved in sanctifying the world. That's why you can't use creator, redeemer, and sanctifier, because they don't specify the person specifically enough. Okay. If that's, that's a, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay, I wanted to talk to you. Uh, no, no, it's a, listen, this this thing could last four hours if it wanted to. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about, corporal works of mercy and how involved you are in those. And I wanted to speak about the two of those, whether it's visiting people in prison and then anointing of the sick and dying. Do you do a lot of visits with people who are dying? And I, I mean, I've always, I have, I don't have a fascination with death, but I'm thinking about it a lot and, um, you know, memento mori, but I, I'm just wondering, you know, what is it like as a priest to deal with people who are dying? You know, do they do they talk much about spirituality? Do they talk much about fear? Like, what do you find people most speaking about when it when they come toward the end? Uh, okay, there's a lot there. Um, well, it's 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 one of uh, great privileges as a priest is to be able to to you know, anoint someone, uh, when they're dying, let me back up and say, um, what we would call the last rites. Uh, it depends on the circumstance. It ideally, if a person is conscious, the last rites would involve giving them, uh, the sacrament of confession, anointed the sick and communion, which is called viaticum when it's received the last time. So if they're conscious and able to eat and so forth, that would be the ideal because they're, they're most able to participate in the in the sacraments and make a good confession stuff however if the person is unconscious you can anoint them right. which is often the case if you get like called to the hospital so the way it works here nashville has um i don't know maybe half a dozen hospitals and the Saint, greater Saint Thomas yeah and are the bigger ones within the yeah, yeah there's uh but uh there's several ho- anyway the way uh some hos- the catholic hospitals of which there are two here in Nashville, St. Thomas, Midtown, St. Thomas West. They have actual Catholic chaplains that they hire, yeah, priests on staff that they uh, – that. and then um, – now, if a, if a priest has a parishioner who's in the hospital, they might uh, ask for a visit from their pastor, which is fine. Now, the, the secular or non-Catholic hospitals, they may not all be secular, but um, – They don't have – when my yeah. son was born, I asked that the priest could just do like, like a blessing. Yeah. I got some. I got a guy who came and said, "I'm not a priest. Do you still want a blessing?" I said, "Absolutely. You know that that'd be great." But uh, yeah, I do. So a lot of times they will have some sort of a pastoral care department or whatever, which is usually Protestant chaplains. But they're able to get a hold of Catholic priests. So we have like a like a deacon who helps coordinate priests to come visit to the different hospitals. Yeah, well, it's kind of a, te- a group text of different. It depends on the circumstances. So, and like whichever priest is available, we'll we'll try to to do, go and do and cover that. And and it depends on the urgency of it, you know. Um, uh, okay, so um, I just lost my. Oh, so yeah. Uh, sometimes the, it might be somebody you know who's dying. There's also a, a hosp a couple. There's a, a hospice up the road here, a live hospice that um, if they have a Catholic who's dying, they'll they'll call one of us. 
a priest to come. So if the person's conscious, you know, it's just a matter of anointing them. And sometimes there's family present and sometimes there's not. Um, I have had cases where the maybe a family member is Catholic, but the person dying is a Protestant. And unless they've requested the sacraments themselves, you, you're not supposed to give it to them. But what you can do is pray the Chapel of Divine Mercy right. because there's a beautiful promise Christ makes to uh, through St. Faustina, who's a, uh, a Catholic nun. Uh, I think she died maybe in the 1930s. And uh, that he gave this revelation to a series of revelations called the the Divine Mercy Devotion of what one of which is the Chapel of Divine Mercy. Anyway, uh, to to paraphrase, he basically says, if you pray this chaplet in the presence of the dying, that I will stand between my father and the dying person, not as their just judge, but as their merciful savior. So he promises special graces at the moment of death um, when that chaplet is prayed. So you can do that. As a, as a lay person, you could pray the Chapel of Divine Mercy, and you can easily find on the internet um, what it consists of uh, in the presence of somebody who's dying, especially if, if they're not a Catholic and stuff. So and even if they are, you still can. So that can be a beautiful thing to do. Um, so, yeah. The, okay. how, how are people... I guess I guess a lot of people are unconscious, too, but well, do you spend much time with uh, people who are... I don't want to say actively dying, but who are dying, who don't really have a long time left, but who know and but who are able to kind of yeah. either be in hospice at home or just kind of yeah. spend their. Do you spend a lot of time with people like that, or it's part of it's part of what we encounter usually. Uh, if well, you know there are, there are church members who you know are are sick and maybe right. sick for years or a long time, that you kind of see that coming and. That's that's the best case because you can visit them over a longer period of time and you get to know their family and stuff like that. Other times it may just be a stranger that you got called in to to see. But, you know, we tend to always see, from a secular point of view, we tend to always see death and suffering as, as bad things. But oftentimes they can be ways that God uses to help bring a person to him. So, for example, I've used this, you know, in a, in a, in a homily— Let's say, you know, there's somebody who's going along full speed ahead, you know, maybe a workaholic, never, always living on the horizontal level about the next, his business or whatever he's focused on and uh, maybe to the neglect of his family or other things. But he never thinks about the vertical dimension. He never thinks about his spiritual life, his relationship with God, his mortality, all these things. All of a sudden, maybe he gets in a major car wreck. And he's laid up in the hospital for three months with very little to do but think about such right. things. Yeah. That actually is ben- more beneficial to his soul than if he's just going along healthy with nothing wrong with him. So right. what what looks like uh, you know, a bad thing uh, can actually be beneficial for him. So it can help him enter into himself um, and um, focus on those important things and, and take stock of his life and maybe change his life and, and hopefully come back to God. And, but there's also outside of that sort of thing, there's also this season of Lent that the church gives us. Mm-hmm. Of course, we, we want to be turning away from sin all the time, but Lent is a really good time to focus on that, uh, on our spiritual life. Have I uh, put God at the center of my life, or have I allowed other priorities to take his place, um, c- to kind of do a spiritual spring cleaning of our souls, if you will, and you know make a good confession and, and think about our prayer lives and set some goals for, for putting God back in the center. And so that's the way we should be doing if we're living our faith well is using those opportunities in the church's liturgy to uh, to help you know uh, turn away from things um, that are bad and tend to focus on God and to prepare for death really yeah. Um, yeah okay okay two more things in parting okay one do you ever wear the cassock I find it to be cool do you wear the cassock much yeah I do uh, I uh, <laughs> I, I don't have one that fits me real good, and I've I've ordered. Uh, well, anyway, long story short, is I tried to order from a place during COVID, and I couldn't go there and be fitted, and it's a it's a place out of Chicago and stuff, so it didn't fit me. But anyway, I, I need to get uh, anyway the the ratio. I need to lose some weight as part of it too, but okay. I need to get a, a cassock that fits better because I only have one, and it, it kind of chokes my neck, but. Um, I do try to wear it, but I, I, I want to wear it more. I just got out of the habit of it because I only have the one, and it's it, – oh, okay, I'm sorry. But you don't need special permission to wear, to wear a cassock, right. and that's another example of some bishops actually forbid their guys from wearing cassocks because right. I, I think part of it is um, 
and, and part of the whole, you know, doing like auto reentrement thing. Some people, I think, mistakenly think that that it's a reve- re- rejection of the current church or of Vatican II. Now, for some people, maybe it is, but that's not what I and most of the priests I know. We, we're currently we're in the current church. We just want to live in a more orthodox, traditional way that are consistent with those values that our forefathers practice in the faith. And and um, we're not trying to... I mean, yeah, we would be rejecting sort of the perversion of Vatican II that, you know, that uh, which would be like, oh, you know, the rules don't matter anymore. We can live however we want. Right. Oh, the church changed this, and she's going to change all these other things down the road. And, um, but just yeah. aesthetically and visually, it's yeah. everything about, you know, pre-Vatican II yeah. are just better like I, I the cassocks look awesome you know what i mean like i sure, yeah. i think so the old missiles look great the yeah. you know i mean they do incense at uh, you know modern masses but you know not like how they do at, at at the tridentine or even even this one it's just all of these things that people may consider uh antique or maybe too old or out of touch I, I think I like them, and a lot of younger men, I'm sure that you've yeah. noticed this a lot, they appreciate that yeah. as well, which is why there's been this sort of surge in Catholicism among younger men. Yeah. Final thing, and this is imparting, for everybody that's been listening, I, you know that we've been nixing the video part of this podcast, and it's just been audio. If anyone wants to use their imagination, Father Neely looks like Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, yeah that's what I, fi- I figured you do. I also look a little like Adam Savage from the Mythbusters. Okay, so uh, so the two of them kind of together. Yeah. yeah, okay, that but, makes sense. But less blonde and more reddish hair. But. Well, we appreciate we appreciate the red hair, obviously. Uh, Father, thank you for taking the time. Uh, let, if you if you ever want to do this again, if maybe I can get another guest on and we can maybe expand more on the mass. I know you obviously have limited time. You're the only priest in this parish, but uh, this was very fun. So thank you. Thank you. My okay. pleasure. That's it.